uh, presentation. I have one question to the speaker. Uh, the last slides you suggest to formalization of the informal sector. Uh, my question is, uh, first of all, uh, I guess things you didn't uh, present uh, much statistics. Those uh, women uh, that uh, participate in the labor market, in the informal sector, uh, one, because of their uh, their own human capital, and the second is because their timing uh, thinks that women have more responsibility uh, to the families. If you informal, uh, if you formalize the informal sector, perhaps they lost the job. Uh, what is uh, you? What do you mean, the formalization? Uh, my name is Hoai from CAM Vietnam. Uh, thank you all for three presentations. They are very interesting and informative. Um, I have questions for the uh, first presentations on Chi Chinese uh, experience um, on income uh, inequalities. Um, actually, it's a, um, there are many features. It's the same in Vietnam, with, especially with the uh, rising chance of uh, inequality during the development process uh, over the past decades and um, and uh, in the presentation you ask you so uh, ask the questions whether uh, China uh, reached the um, the tops of coolness curve in terms of inequality during the development process um, uh, however uh, there are several um, ex many experts uh, ex uh, view, especially one in the uh, recently famous book, uh, public, uh, namely um, Capital in the 21st Century, and they um, argue that the Kuznets hypothesis is no longer relevant, uh, given the past experience of uh, many countries. Uh, so, um, what is our views on this one? Uh, whether uh, the uh, rising chance of inequality in China is uh, like um, this have a feature like a Kuznets curve, or maybe, or does the government need to do some things uh, to 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 um, reduce the uh, increase this increasing chance? Yeah. This is the first question, and um, the second question is about the. You mentioned a lot about the uh, urban and rural and regional uh, aspects of inequality. And they, I think it is normal because uh, in terms of economic growth, you also need to um, give a pri uh, prioritize uh, the resource to several, we call the economic poles in the, in the uh, economy. So that will create the kind of the uh, rural, urban, or even the regional uh, aspects of uh, inequality. Uh, but um, um, but uh, in terms of policy, um, what do you think the government uh, should do to, to, to um, in this regard, uh, in terms of rising inequality? And the last question is about the uh, is that uh, how is the inequality issues uh, is considered on the government agenda, the Chinese government agenda, or, or, or mainly uh, uh, Chinese government mainly um, touches on reducing poverty rather than the inequality uh, reduction? Thank you. You seem to be challenging. There was a paper by, I think, uh, Guan Huan and, and Anthony Shorrox. You know, when they first talk about the, the importance of, um, I can't remember which the date was, but it's quite a, it's a well-known paper. And the, the, their argument is that, you know, as you find, a, a large component of, of inequality in China is the, this spatial component that comes out in your tile decomposition. Um, now, I, I didn't really pick up from your, you presented Genie uh, at the rural and urban uh, picture at the start, but you know, Genie's not terribly well suited to that. You know, these kind of uh, spatial comparisons. Obviously, you could get Genie's going up in urban and 
rural separately and then the Gini overall going down because of the nature of Gini. I wondered if, are you challenging what they say? Because essentially they're saying, actually China is two countries almost, almost that there's a rural China and an urban China and within urban, within rural, there isn't so much inequality. But I wasn't able to pick that up. And if that is what you're saying, that's, that's quite a, a strong conclusion. I, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity of, uh, of saying, is that something you did find? Because I, I noticed that uh, they're not using the local courts, the farmers, uh, and almost 50% of the reallocations have uh, disputes. And I'm thinking, is that a strategy, do you think, from, from farmers to get around the local courts to, to province level uh, and get the attention of, of uh, province, province level caterers? It could be a strategy. The first is that the Kuznets uh, hypothesis can be applied to developing country like uh, China, Vietnam, something like that. My answer is no. You say, yeah, I totally agree with uh, Thomas Piketty's opinions on that. You see, if you yeah, look at the literature, you see, even the Kusinyi hypothesis is based on the data from, you see, develop, developed countries, you see, in the, <coughs> from the uh, early of the 20th century to the yeah, 50s, yeah. So that is, but if you look at the appearance, even in the developing countries, you will find income equality decrease during the 60s or 70s, largely yeah, due to you see, redistributing policies, not due to you see, economic development, something like that. Yeah, I think Robert Campbell is, uh, had the, the article, uh, the papers summarize main argument on the Kuznets yeah, hypothesis that. Even yeah, when we yeah, talk about uh, the Kuznets hypothesis in China, there's still a lot of uh, Chinese scholars believe yeah, uh, Kuznets hypothesis can be applied to the China. You see, when you say, you say slight decrease in the you say, income equality, they say, okay, yeah, Kuznets hypothesis is a uh, turning point yeah, is uh, coming, so something like that. Yeah, my yeah, personally, do not believe. Yeah, China is the case. The Kuznets hypothesis can explain. Uh, so the second, uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, in China, probably Yunnan, there are very large income gap between urban and rural areas. Uh, you just uh, said it's whether whether it's normal or not. Yeah, there are some yeah, gap. Yeah, it's not so big. Yeah, you can say it's normal. In the any countries, you will find, you say, income gap between rural and urban areas. But when we say a very large gap, you say this gap maintained at a very high level. So that will say that, why? Yeah, there's so large gap. So then we find there yeah, are a lot of, you say, uh, the policy or institutions in favor of urban areas. Also, there are some, you say, mobility is the barriers yeah, for the, to the rural people, to the urban farm. Even in urban areas, there are a lot of discrimination policy against the rural people, something like that. I think that policy really play very important role in explain, you say, high income gap, you see. That means, uh, so that come to your third questions. Yeah, what kinds of uh, the government policy will be, you see, <coughs> implemented to reduce the income gap between rural and rural. Uh, I think in the last five years, the government issues a lot of uh, policies, such as then the Polish, uh, the whole co system, I don't know. Yeah, that is household registration system. That means, uh, you see, uh, in China, urban people and the rural people have a difference, the whole co difference, uh, you see, ID card, something like that. So now the government won't reduce, you see, a division of the whole co system. Uh, another is that the government want to put more resources in 
to the rural areas uh, try to support the development of, of compulsory education, provide more <coughs> support to the poor people in rural areas, give a lot of subsidy to rural areas. Yeah, in that way, they try to reduce income gap between rural and urban areas. So, yeah, there are some of the government policy agendas. In last year, uh, several ministers issue a package of the income distribution reform. That means uh, they have a lot of, uh, you say, policy, new policy will be introduced in the next five years. I think that policy will be, yeah, the work, yeah, perhaps in the future, something like that. Uh, now come to the last question, yeah. Uh, yes. You say the China, you say there's some <coughs> inequality within the urban area, some inequality even in yeah, rural area, something like that. When you come to yeah, I think the uh, contributors to inequality in urban area quite different from that, yeah, in the rural area, something like that. Uh, in rural area, you see regional difference is quite large in rural area. Yeah, if you look compare is the in household income between coastal area and the western area. You will find very big, that difference. That's a large difference depend on, you see, non-farming activities. You see, you know, more, you see, non-farming activity in the coastal area. Also, a lot of migrants moving from west area to yeah, rural area, something. Uh, but when we come to the urban areas, yeah, uh, as I mentioned that, the large difference you say come from the uh, skilled, unskilled works as a result of return, rising return to education, something like that. So yeah, I agree with you that there's some yeah, uh, different reasons for rising income equality within and urban area and within rural area, something like that. Uh, yeah, I cannot uh, yeah, talk in detail about, uh, yeah many, many, yeah, contributors to that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren? Uh, let me just kind of take these in turn, and I have rel relatively kind of strong views on Chinese inequality, so I want to say a few things about that as well. <laughs> uh, first, in terms of Hendrick's uh, you know, comment, the reason why the courts aren't being used is because the state doesn't want to allow households to use the courts that they're willing to allow the households to go ahead and to, press, you know, to use the courts as a mechanism to press claims again against other households. But when it happens to be, again, a claim again against the state or some injustice that they feel has been done by higher levels of government, extremely difficult to do. And in fact, there's been a recent, again, announcement by the highest of Supreme Court, again, one of the, one of the judges there who basically says as much. And so I think that one of the things, again, that we're seeing is that the state, again, and the party in a variety of ways is trying to go ahead and to restrict, again, the way in which the legal system is used, again, in terms of allowing households to go ahead and to press their claims. So I think that's the most important, again, reason in terms of why the courts uh, aren't being used at the current moment. In terms of inequality of land, in terms of the role that it happens to have in, in, a, in terms of inequality, again, in the countryside, again, there's a lot of favorite word, heterogeneity. It's certainly the case that in the countryside that inequality of land has gone ahead and increased. But what's happened in the inequality at the same time is that the returns to land relative to the returns to labor have just fall, fallen, have fallen enormously. And so the contribution that land or income from land today, in part this is because of the agricultural policies uh, that are in part, again, kind of reducing the returns to agriculture for a lot of these households, uh, they're just, again, that's not the issue that when we take a look at where the inequality is rising, and again, the reason it's rising in rural and in rural China. Again, it's really, again, about nature of human capital and skills that individuals have to be able to access uh, the labor market that's become extremely important and more important over time. Uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it was about the ability of households to move into family-run businesses, that before households and individuals were be able to, to migrate, it was the ability of households to move into these small family-run enterprises that were extremely uh, important, and there it was access to capital and access to skills that were extremely important uh, in that regard. So. Uh, it, land inequality has increased again in some areas, or at least access to these use rights have, but I don't believe, again, it's the most important thing in terms of what's contributing to inequality. In terms of looking at the bigger picture of inequality in China, that what I would argue is I've never been really happy with this view that urban-rural inequality is rising. And a lot of it has to do with measurement. 
And so if you go ahead and if you were to accurately measure what the differences was, difference in, in urban rural incomes in the late 1970s and you measured everything again correctly, that what you would find is that the differences in terms of income between the countryside and the cities was probably on the order of four to five to one. So it's a very difficult measurement issue because throughout much of the 80s and even into the early 1990s, individuals in the, in the cities again, either through again access to consumer goods, grain, other things at preferential prices, either through access again of all kinds of non-pecuniary benefits again that they were entitled again through if they were working in state-owned enterprises, those things are just very, very difficult again to be able to, to measure. The other, re other issue that we run into is that if you take a look in terms of urban rural income differences in China, is that we've seen, again, massive urbanization over, the time, over time. And so that when today, when people are comparing urban and rural, rural, in some sense, is not even being held constant. And so in other kind of calculations, again, that we've done over the years, is that if you could go ahead and if you could fix urban, define urban, again, at a given point in time, what you would find is that urban rural differences even measured that way, again, aren't rising. But the problem that we have today is that all the more successful areas, again, rural areas, they're effectively kind of attriting out of the rural sample. They're now, again, urban incomes are higher. And so what you have is what you got left over are those areas, again, that aren't growing nearly as rapidly. So it looks like urban rural income differences are rising when, in fact, they're not. That moreover, that when you start to take a look at China on a regional basis, is that what you'll see is that there's unbelievably important differences in terms of all of the inequality dynamics between the coastal provinces and between the interior. That if you were to take a look at a province like Zhejiang, which is south of, of, of Jiangsu, that what you would find is that over the course of the last 30 or 40 years, that the increases in inequality over that period of time have been relatively modest. If you go ahead and if you go into the interior, that what you'll find is that that's where we see some of the largest, again, increases in inequality. And it has an awful lot, again, to do, again, with the nature of the reforms that have been going on. So that when we talk about regional differences in inequality in China, I mean, the thing that we want to remember is that this is, again, a, a country where there's been massive reform that have allowed people to move out, off the land, move, people to move from the west to the east, that product markets, again, have been liberalized, again, significantly. So in some sense, all of those things, again, should have been helping to reduce the differences, again, between the West and the East. And that what I would argue, contrary to what a lot of people argue, I would say that state policy, the development of the Great West policy, all of those things, again, in some sense, have been major contributing factors, again, to the fact that the West hasn't grown more rapidly than what it has. So it's a policy problem as opposed to just you know, fundamental differences, again, between regions. I understand that is very uh, different questions, but I can also take uh, one example from Vietnam to see how we can do it. Actually, in urban, um, in urban area in Vietnam now, many families they need support for the uh, for the ch for the children um, caring, and um, while the public services it's not enough to support the women in family to do that, uh, many families now. Uh, need domestic helper from rural areas. And it is very common now in Hanoi, in Ho Chi Minh City, and big cities. So almost the family with the small children, they have the domestic helper from rural areas. And almost for 15 years, a gender specialists are talking about the domestic helper, who, who, to, who can take them if they work for the family owners. And, uh, and recently, after I think that 10 or 15 years, and now uh, two years ago, when we uh, approved the labor court, um, one uh, regulations, an article on the domestic health were already included in the labor court. That means a uh, family owner who hired a domestic helper should have a minimum income, should have some meet to some um, uh, requirement and condition for the, for the domestic helper. So I think that is one example of how we can formalize um, the informal sector. Of course, I understand that it's not easy for all, but actually, if we try to do uh, as much achievement for the women work can govern by law. And other example, um, I think that now for the social insurance, um, only the worker who have a uh, contract for three months, uh, three months work, they, have, they are in tie the social insurance in Vietnam. But actually, if the contract only three months, and, and less three months, a lot of women, now it's only one month or two months. Even employer, employers, they avoid that because they don't, they don't want to, to, um, to pay for the social insurance. So if we try to do like a, a just policy, how to incorporate, how to women can more benefit from policy, that is I'm talking about the formalizations. Yes.
Thank you. I'm Joseph from Ghana. Um, Farm, you talked about the uh, difficulty in, in terms of the family sharing responsibility uh, between uh, the males and females or the preference for, for sons. Uh, how is that being managed in terms of changing the norm or the, the social preference so that uh, both men and or both boys and girls as children will be given the same preference uh, in terms of their family issues, in terms of their gender issues has been uh, raised in Vietnam? Um, you are talking about, we are talking about the gender stereotypes of the women role in the family. Because actually it's the Vietnamese women, uh, I think that's different from the Asian uh, other countries. They do both productions, very active in the economic activities, and also they do the production. And even, this, uh, you are talking about the social norm and the trends. Um, I think that is for the nuclear family in the urban areas is is different from the rural areas. But in Vietnam now, almost seventy percent of the population is a rural area, and the social norm for the chain is still very slow compared to the urban areas. Um, in the urban area, it's a family only nuclear family, but only uh, they don't they don't live with the parents. So that is a different pattern. They can have each other. It's more sharing from the uh, from husband for the wife. Um, but for the uh, for extended family, uh, I think that is a small burden on the women because uh, they uh, they need to not only uh, to take care of the children, but also the parent in law and also relative uh, also. So. Um, we can. I can think from my personal uh, uh, view. I can think that is uh, economic development is more ahead compared to the social change, especially in the gender stereotypes. It's quite very slowly changed in Vietnam. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, well, we've had three presentations there from experts in their field on three different aspects of inequality. Income inequality in China, land inequality or inequality, uh, inequality in the use of land, in, uh, again, in China, gender inequality. These are things which are really important in these countries, but these are things that are really important in lots of countries. And these land issues, these gender issues, these, these issues about what men and women do inside the household and stuff, these are things that we recognize from lots of countries. So hopefully there are useful lessons um, for, for, for all of us, whatever countries we represent. Let me just finally thank the, thank the speakers for excellent presentations and thank you for your questions and inputs. Thank you very much.